Tonight on Nation to Nation, in Nova Scotia, baby eels or alvers can be a lucrative business, but there's been a moratorium placed on harvesting due to reports of violence on rivers. For me, um, I think the number one thing they could have did is they could have policed the rivers before it got to a point of, of explosion. Ten Northern Ontario First Nations from the Treaty 9 area have launched a historic legal case against the Ontario and federal governments. It's about making things the way they always were supposed to be, and I will say the evidence is fully on our side. Annie Beaujau, I'm Annette Francis, and welcome to Nation to Nation. Two weeks ago, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans temporarily stopped the harvesting of alvers. They are baby eels, which are caught and sent to Asia, where they are grown for food. It can be profitable. A kilogram of alvers can be sold for over $5,000. The DFO shut down harvesting due to alleged poaching by First Nation harvesters and reports of violence. However, treaty rights advocate Cheryl Maloney says First Nations people are not poaching, but exercising their treaty right. She joins me now. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Ms. Maloney. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Why do you see the situation as a treaty rights issue? The weeks leading up to the closure, there was zero presence by DFO or RCMP on the rivers, unless there was an incident. And it felt like we were back where we were um, with the lobster um, exercise of our lobster rights when we launched our treaty-based lobster fish, and there was no, um, no DFO, no Coast Guard, no RCMP to protect us. And we were on the water with commercial boats circling us. And you've all seen the violence that happened there. We feel the same thing has happened here. The minister just let us go. Um, so they're saying, you know, this in order to uh, keep public safety, they had to shut it down. With the indigenous laws, you have to you have to fulfill certain steps. And one of them has to be minimal impairment of an impact to a right. And for me, um, I think the number one thing they could have did is they could have policed the rivers before it got to a point of, of explosion. So it was almost like they just sent us in to fight and just waited it out until something happened to justify closing it down. So the public safety issues should have been addressed long ago. And uh, DFO, Coast Guard, RCMP should be protecting uh, Mi'kmaq harvesters in carrying out those rights. There was no protection on, on, the, um, on the rivers for harvesters. And we were just left on our own until there was enough you know, for the minister to uh, to cite public safety. So she puts conservation concerns in her uh, memo, but we haven't really uh, figured out what those are. And, and the Indigenous fishers that I spoke to, they said, we don't trust her conservation. You know, they said, Cheryl, they always say conservation. And back in 1999, when we won the uh, Marshall decision, the whole country was against us, you know, for conservation of lobster stocks. And now we fast forward 24 years and the lobster stocks are still fine. So I did a little bit of research um, on the Alver and, and I'm not saying I'm an expert or, or uh, anything and that I can say conservation isn't an issue. I'm saying we don't know what the minister was thinking. We know that there's dams in Nova Scotia, hundreds of dams that are killing alvers right now, blocking the river system. So the river systems that have dams in Nova Scotia, the alvers are not getting through. So if there is conservation issues in Nova Scotia, then Nova Scotia power should be shut down also. These dams should be opened up to allow free access to alvers to, uh, to migrate. What does uh, harvesting alvers mean, econom and mean economically for those who are doing it, for those families? Well, there's two fisheries going on in, in Nova Scotia that um, are, are getting economic benefit from the alver fishery. One is the nine corporate license holders in the province. And under each corporate license, they're allocated so many quota and so many rivers and they have hired workers fishers on each of those rivers 
So they owned those rivers for decades now. This fishery was going on for decades. Um, the elder population increased from 1996 to 2014. Um, so they've had this corporate monopoly over um, the elders. And now the Mi'kmaq people who have been removed from the river system for hundreds of years, and up into 1985, I was allowed, I was not allowed to step outside the reserve lines, five square miles of Sabag and Agate, to hunt or fish and trap, which I did with my dad. But we couldn't step our foot into the farmer's field. We weren't allowed in the rivers. We weren't allowed, you know, in our traditional hunting and fishing grounds. So now what you see and what I've witnessed was Mi'kmaq people back on those rivers, those beautiful rivers with million dollar homes nearby. They're, that's their view. But those were our rivers. Those were our river systems. Those were our roads. Those were our food sources. That was how we sustained our people. So whether we use an Alvers to for food or sustenance, it all comes to the, the same thing. This other fishery that's going on in Nova Scotia is feeding the mouths of children, women and children. Like myself and my sisters, we went out. Um, we, we didn't make a profit even, but I was exercising my rights. And I was getting um, involved in the economy of the elver fishery in Nova Scotia in a very small, modest way with a $200 dip net. And um, a lot of these families, I've seen people try to exercise their rights in lobsters, but you need thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy a fishing boat to go on the water. It's not accessible to a single mom. So if you got a single mom with, you know, two young teenage boys out fishing, this fishery is accessible. They get $600 with the um, dip nets and a bucket, and they're making enough money to pay for a car to improve their lifestyle for their home. For the second year in a row, Ottawa has given 14% of the commercial quota to First Nations harvesters. How does that fill up to, to live up to its uh, treaty obligations? I think if conservation considerations are a concern of the minister, then she should, one, Nova Scotia Power should not be allowed to um, open those or close those dams and, and stop the flow of the elder population. Two, the commercial industry will have to be cut back. And the last ones that should be on the water or in the rivers or, or uh, creating sustenance and economy should be the First Nations rights holders. Constitutional um, rights, Trump privilege, every day of the week at the Supreme Court of Canada and in the Constitution of Canada's uh, supreme law of the land, um, it should trump all conservation and, and corporate interest. Commercial fishers, though, say it's an unregulated unregul mess where conservation is ignored. How do you respond to those types of comments? Well, that's a problem with the federal government um, and something that we have to, as First Nations governments, put our head together and um, recognize the right of Mi'kmaq people to self-govern and regulate and manage their um, their fisheries. Right now, we're criminalized for it. So nobody's coming to the table and saying, how are we going to manage and enforce you know, the, el the indigenous elver fishery? Uh, first thing Canada has to do is stop denying it, stop trying to impose policy um versus implement you know the Supreme Court of Canada decisions implement implement and honor respect the treaties and the nation to nation basis of our um our existence here in, in uh, Mi'kma'ki and, and Turtle Island. Okay. We'll leave it there. That's all the questions I have. Miigwech, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. After the break, Ontario and the federal government have been served with a lawsuit that could cost some billions. I'll be right back.
welcome back. Several First Nations from Treaty 9 are suing both the federal and Ontario governments for $95 billion. It's over who has the final say over lands and resources in their territory. It covers two-thirds of Ontario's landmass from Timmins North, including the resource-rich Ring of Fire. At issue is the lack of consent in mining and developments in their traditional territories. Kate Kempton is the lead lawyer for the 10 First Nations challenging the province and federal government. She joins me now. Welcome. Hello. So, Kate, why did you bring this action in the first place? The Crown says that it's the only government with ultimate decision making authority. And that while the Crown has to consult with First Nations, has to accommodate them, that at the end of the day, if the Crown and First Nations don't agree, the Crown is the only government, basically, although there's fed, it's divided itself between federal and provincial levels, it, it's one Crown. They do not recognize the decision-making governance authority of First Nations over our land. We're not talking about reserve. We're talking about full traditional territories that take up all of the landmasses of Canada. And so what we are saying in this case is we're stepping right out of that box of unilateral jurisdiction and saying that is not correct. It never was that Treaty 9 actually guaranteed and promised co-jurisdiction. So this is really a case about uh, who the governments are and who makes what decisions. And we are saying that Indigenous governance, uh, governments on the one hand um, and Crown governments on the other both must consent to laws, policies, and developments on shared treaty land before those things go ahead. It's like having parallel parliaments. That's what this case is about. It's, it's about time it was brought. The framework of colonialism where there's only one crown government, there's a crown government only at the pinnacle of decision making is destroying the environment, uh, destroying dignity, uh, destroying our hope for the future and enough is enough. So it's come out now because of that and because of imminent threats that the Ontario government has been making to recklessly start a bunch of mining development in the ring of fire that could have catastrophic results for, well, globally for humanity, but certainly for the First Nations. And so as of today, the Crown has been given official notice of the claim. So what happens next? pressure mounts mostly by the Ontario government to get at the lands and resources that are really within uh, the Treaty 9 First Nations ultimate control, that they will feel the need to sit down and work out a co-jurisdiction regime. And I, we're not talking about ad hoc consent here, maybe not consent there. We are talking about a formalized like a bilateral decision-making structure and processes, as I said, forgive the language, but like parallel parliaments, which will take a number of years to negotiate, but we hope that the Crown will agree to do that before we have to take all of this case to trial. What would du dual jurisdiction, what would that look like? There are examples of it in parts of the world um, you know, even Canada-U.S. treaties or the Canada-U.S.-Mexico-NAFTA treaty where certain things required mutual consent. And it, it would potentially look something like that where at a, at a much higher level than engagement happens now, you have both governments developing policies and laws. Um, you have the requirement for both to consent, but if both have been developing it all the way through, they are more likely to both consent. And then if they don't, there's some independent uh, dispute resolution mechanism. So in Canada, it's the Crown Court, it's the court system of the colonial government that decides when the Crown and First Nations are in dispute. Ultimately, we need to get to a regime where a third party that is not either of them uh, resolve impasses. 
How did you arrive at a figure of $95 billion? The $95 billion is, is a calculation based on the fact that they have acted unilaterally, sucked all the benefits out and left all the harms in Treaty 9 territory, they being the Crown governments. Uh, and it's calculated based on the percentage of the land mass that Treaty 9 occupies times the um, of Ontario, times Ontario's annual gross revenue that it earns from all sources. And it's a it's a proxy calculation, but that's how we landed on that number. You said uh, evidence is on your side. Is George McMartin's diary from 1905 part of that evidence? It will be, yes. But there's, there's almost, <clears throat> well, frankly, I haven't seen any evidence that contradicts the message we're delivering here. That it's consistently across the board. It's well known by historians and on in archival records that Canada drafted the treaty, consulted with Ontario in drafting it. The three treaty commissioners that went out to the various posts to so-called negotiate Treaty 9 with the First Nations never disclosed that written treaty. They, get, they put it in their pocket and they showed up at these treaty talks and made oral promises that the First Nations agreed to orally. And then the treaty commissioners pulled out of their pockets the written text, which was never in the talks and said, here, sign here. That, that's fraud. The statement of claim is, is asking for a permanent injunction, stopping Ontario and Ottawa from acting uh, without the plaintiff's consent. What exactly does that mean? Well, I mean, we're not going to, to get a permanent injunction, we have to be seeking that at trial. And if this case goes to trial, it's a number of years away. It takes a long time to gather all the evidence and the other side has to do theirs. Um, but in the meantime, we could seek interlocutory injunctions, which last as long as the, until the trial decision is rendered. Um, and that, that's also being sought uh, in the pleadings. We, we would have to go to court while the case is pending, while the, you know, until we get to the final trial and argue that, that we need uh, a shorter term Junction to stop unilateral decision making that threatens the plaintiff's way of life. And if we get that, then it stops the things we're seeking to stop, such as mining, uh, until a final decision is rendered. But it, it you know, an injunction means stop. How long do you think that could take if it goes to trial? Well, I hate to say this, but likely easily 10 years or more. These big cases, they tend to um, require a huge amount of evidence, as I said, by both sides and just the time to do all of the research. Um, and there are a number of procedural steps before trial that are usually uh, taken. We might get motions by the Crown defendants to force us to answer certain questions or seeking to strike out the claim or parts of the claim, that those are rather normal things in a big case like this. So I, I would not be surprised if it was 10 plus years before we are at trial. Recently, the province of Ontario accepted a First Nations plan to build a road to the resource-rich ring of fire. How would such a dispute like this be dealt with? Or how should it be dealt yeah. with? Unfortunately, I'm going to sound like I'm <clears throat> against the roads, but um, you know the position of my clients on the Ring of Fire has been no until we know, N O until we K N O W, and that First Nations jointly who share the territory up in the James Bay and Hudson Bay lowlands need to be engaged in a leadership position with the Crown again, sharing the decision making to assess all the implications environmental, cultural, social, climate, about large-scale development in the Ring of Fire. It is completely a, a fiction to suggest that 
if the roads are built, it'll just be the roads. It's actually one road with three segments. And, and nobody's suggesting that a First Nation should remain remote if it wants to be hooked up to the highway system. But two of those three proposed segments are to elongate the whole of the road so that it provides access into the ring of fire for mining. And so you can't, you know, somebody comes to greet me, they're shaking my hand and they're not then talking to my hand. They're engaging with all of me. And so when you go to look at the roads, you can't just look at the roads. You have to look at the roads as part of a much bigger plan to open up the whole region to mining. And, and the implications of that could be catastrophic, but we don't know in terms of climate, biodiversity, impact on culture, and First Nations jurisdiction even worse than it is now. Okay. Well, miigwech. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you. Time for a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The person tasked with helping the federal government find an Indigenous and human rights ombudsperson was before a Senate committee Tuesday morning. Jennifer Moore Rattray is now the special representative to Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller. The appointment of an ombudsperson is one of the calls to justice in the final report of the inquiry into the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Or what kind of special powers is the ombudsperson going to need in order to make sure that they can accomplish some of these things that to date have been difficult, if not impossible? Thank you so much, Senator. I think you've really outlined the reason why this work is so important and why the establishment of this office is so important. That was, in fact, the word teeth. Um, came up in the very first conversation I had with family members and survivors following um, the announcement uh, of, of, of my piece of, of work. Um, and that's exactly what they said, that, that whatever you do, it has to have teeth. It has to mean something. It can't just be uh, 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 pretty words. It has to be more than pretty words. Lives are literally at stake. At another Senate committee on Thursday, Natawana Hag First Nation Chief George Ganesh appeared. He testified about the sometimes rocky relationship his Mi'kmaq community has had with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, about how the 1999 Marshall decision allowing First Nations to pursue a moderate livelihood has not been fully implemented. Chief Ganesh said that traditional knowledge about fishing should be held at the same level as science. And it's a true pro a true, par true partnership then. It's not DFO uh, utilizing their science to restrict our, our treaty access. It's looking at ways to collaborate and to develop a fishery that that honors the treaties and that meets the needs of our communities. Because quite frankly, it's, uh, it has been 24 years. I've been a chief for 26 years. So I've experienced this entire uh, pushing this up a very steep hill to try to you know, increase opportunity for our peoples. That's all for tonight. And if you missed any part of tonight's show, you can check out our podcast. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. Have a good evening.